We're continuing on in our brief study of this little book of Haggai. Um, as we're looking at it, at it, we're looking at it from the perspective of building for our future on our glorious past. We started this a few weeks ago and we talked about Solomon's temple. We looked at Solomon's temple in the year 930 BC is when uh, he was building the temple and it was glorious. There was a glory about it that manifested itself in the fact that the, the Spirit of God, the living God, came down and the glory of the Lord filled the place. There was so much smoke in it they couldn't even stand in it because it was the glory of the Lord filling it. At the same time, the pillar of cloud was over it to designate that God was in his holy sanctuary. That came to a sudden end in the year five, uh, 586 B.C. In 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, took all the golden vessels and all the, all the articles from the sanctuary and transported them back into Babylon and uh, he had them in his treasury there. Israel was taken captive just as Jeremiah the prophet had said they would be. Because of their refusal to abandon their idolatry, they would go into captivity for 70 years. 48 years after they were taken into captivity, in the year 538 BC, a remnant of the captives returned. Cyrus of the Persians made a decree that uh, they could go back to build the temple of their Lord. And so they made their journey to Jerusalem. Haggai's message, we, we noted last time, took place 18 years later. So the year is now 520 BC. It's 66 years later after the destruction of Jerusalem. That's where the text begins. In the second year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. His message is basically this. We looked at this last week. Consider your ways. He says, consider your ways. You have planted much, he says, but you have harvested little. He goes on and he says, you drink, but you never have your fill. He says, listen, you eat, but you never have enough. The text says you put on clothes, but you're not warm. It must have been a day like today, huh? Yeah, you put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse that has holes in it. You see what's going on here? The harder they work, the behinder they got. Ever felt like that? The more I make, the higher everything goes up. It, it just seems like my money is just not going where it should be going. It's just not stretching. It's just not far enough. I take on a part-time job and I still am behind. How, why is that so? That's what was going on. Haggai then preached. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Now last time I put several translations up there and then I gave you my translation. Set your heart upon your ways or on your path. Set your heart upon your path. He says look inside and see what's going on in your life not on the outside, but on the inside to find out why things are going the way they are on the outside. Do a self-examination. And that's what he's calling for here. He said, listen, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Now, I don't know about you, I don't need God blasting away at what I bring home. I want God blessing what I bring home. But God was blasting away at it. And he says, why? Why, declares the Lord Almighty. And then God answers. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each one of you is busy with his own house. They were not doing God's will. They were doing their own will. While they allowed the temple of the Lord to lay in ruins, they had not only built their own homes, but the text says they were in their paneled homes. This was with expensive inlaid wood. They were paneling the insides of their homes, and they were living in luxury while the house of the Lord lay in ruins. They had their priorities all messed up. 
they had wrong priorities. Not like that doesn't happen today, right? Sometimes we don't have time for the Lord because I got to work. I don't have times for the Lord because, my goodness, I got lion's tickets and they're going to let me down one more time. <laughs> it goes on and on. If it's not the lions, I'm going to the kids' soccer game, the basketball, the grandkids. So I just don't have time to do what God wants me to do. And then we wonder why I'm spinning my wheels in life. My life is not satisfying. It's not abundant. The things that I'm really working and trying to achieve just aren't happening. And when they do happen, I just feel no great satisfaction in what I've done. And I'm depressed. My life is a mess. Wrong priorities. After Haggai preached the message, the people changed their hearts. God stirred up their hearts. Remember the text? They stirred them up. They changed their priorities and they began to work. They began to work. That was a review of last Sunday. So why didn't you just preach it that short last Sunday, right? <laughs> All right. Now it is a month later. They've begun working for about a month. And the, the second message that the prophet brings says, consider your attitude. Your attitude. Primarily saying, consider your attitude towards change. Most people don't like change. There's a few of us who do. I, mean, I don't like eating leftovers. My wife kind of knows that. I just ate that. Why would I want to eat that again? I just had that. Can you give me some other leftover in between so I can kind of mix this up? I would like change. Not everybody likes change. Most people have a hard time with change. You know who has the hardest time with change? Older people. I am amazed at how many older people say, well, I don't have a smartphone. I have a flip phone. Right? I don't understand my grandkids. My grandkids, I don't understand them. I call them and they don't answer their phone. I say, all you got to do is text them. I don't text. Well, maybe you should learn how to text. If you will text, they will answer. You see, older people, well, I don't, that's not the way we did it in my generation. We called, we wanted to talk over the phone. I said, listen, try this experiment. Text your grandson, your granddaughter, and just say, hey, can you talk? Your phone will ring. They'll call you. It's just the new way. It's a different model, a different method. It's a different way. They communicate probably more than you did at that age. They just do it not through letters, not through email, through text. But he said, listen, you've got to consider your attitude towards change is the theme here. Nothing has really changed. Back in his day, in our day, people struggle with change. And that's what's going on in the passage. Now the question is, who needs to change their attitude? Who does? Who needs to change their attitude? Well, I see hands going up. I like that. The, pro the, the prophet was preaching this, and he says here, who needs to consider their attitude? He says, the preacher does. What's the text? On the 21st day of the seventh month, the previous message was on the sixth month, he says, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. So the, the preacher needs this message on change because he's going to deliver the message on change. But also the leaders need to consider change. Oh my goodness, we have such gridlock in Washington, D.C. Anybody notice that? Nobody is willing to be flexible and compromise and make some changes. They don't represent the will of the people because the will of the people want them to work together. Is that correct? No, we do. We want them to work together. Hey, the leader here is Zerubbabel. He's the governor of Judah, but he needs to make some changes. The religious leaders need to make some changes. The high priest, he said, this message is for them, this is for them. He said, goes on, he says, and all the remnant of the people, the people need to change their attitude towards change. And then there's one more he adds, where he really wants to go, he says, but especially the elderly need to consider change. Well, I'm not real fond of what he calls elderly here. 
Because the elderly, as we're going to see in the context, is anybody over 66 years old. That's what he's, they, wait a minute. The elderly need to consider their attitude toward change. It's in this text. Let's take a peek at it. How do you, first of all, I want to clar clarify. How do you clarify your attitude? I mean, what is my attitude? How do I clarify what my attitude is? It's pretty clear here. God asked them, you do it with questions. Now, in the text, we're going to find there's two rhetorical questions. One, who remembers? I guess that's kind of important because the older you get, the more you forget. <laughs> Thank you. You forget. He says, who remembers? That's a rhetorical question because he's really not wanting an answer from the, his audience because he's going to give them the answer. All right? It's a rhetorical question. Second one is, how does it look? How does it look? You're looking out, take, what's it look like to you? Then he's going to give an opinion question. I find that most people have opinions just about everything, whether they voice them or not. What does it seem like to you? What does, these are our questions. But before we look at those, we need a little background on the temple itself, because that's what it's all about, the temple. The building where God is going to meet with his people the place of worship. Before there was a temple, there was a tabernacle. And those of who were with me two years ago when we went through the book of Exodus, we went through the details of the tabernacle. But the main thing I want to get about the tabernacle today is that God would appear and he would lead the people in ancient times in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And that cloud would lead them through the wilderness and when it stopped, he said, put the tabernacle up. Now, the word tabernacle just means a tent. And God dwelt in that tabernacle, in that tw tent. And, and when that cloud appeared, it was telling everybody that God was in the holy temple. And when that cloud picked up and took off, they said, fold up the tent and follow it. And when it stops, then you put the tabernacle, the tent, the sanctuary underneath it, God was leading his people in a visible, tangible way. At night, that pillar of cloud turned into a pillar of fire. God was leading his people. Now we know from the New Testament that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit invaded us on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. He came as a flame of fire on top of the new temple, the body. And he, we are the temple. And as we gather together collectively, this becomes the temple of God. God is in this place. He's here with us. And he was leading them in that. Well, as time went on, David wanted to build a sanctuary. And God said, you can't build one for me because you're a man of war, but your son will build it. And Solomon built the glorious Solomon's temple. It was filled with the glory of the Lord. We saw that a couple weeks ago as we looked at it in Chronicles. God was in his holy sanctuary. But something happened. The people became so idolatrous. God was fed up with his people that it tells us in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 9, 10, and 11, that that glory cloud of the Lord lifted up off of the temple and moved. It moved to the east wall. And from the east wall, it then moved to the east part of the city. From the eastern part of the city, then it moved to the mountains outside Jerusalem. And then from there, it ascended into heaven. And the glory of the temple was gone. That's a sad thing. People continued to worship, but God was not there. Isn't that sad? I'd hate to say it, but there's a lot of churches where the glory of the Lord is not in that place. God has long, long left. They're going through the motions, the routines, the rituals, the liturgies, but God's presence is not there. Bethany has been a historic church. We're 100 years old in September. 100 years old. The glory of the Lord has been in this place. We've had a glorious history. But any time we give up on the word of God 
and the central feature of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glory of this place will also depart. It's the glory of the Lord that we need in this place. A few years later, the people would not repent from the prophet's preaching. In 586 B.C., the temple was destroyed. In 539 B.C., Cyrus issued a decree. I've, written, I've taken out of Ezra chapter 1, verse 2. This is what Cyrus, the Persian, the king of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. God was at work. You see, the heart of the king is in his hand. Whether he's a good king or bad king, the heart of the king is in his hand. He can do with the king whatever he wants. He put it in Cyrus to be the opposite of Nebuchadnezzar. Instead of destroying the temple and taking the people captive, I'm going to get the favor of the people by saying, I'm going to send whoever wants to go back, back and rebuild your temple, and I'll help fund it. And he sent them on their way. 50,000 people went back. You find that in the next chapter of Ezra, Ezra chapter 2. When you get to Ezra chapter 3, they began rebuilding. When they arrived, they started. They started building. And in the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, Jeshua, same Joshua, the high priest, and the remnant of the people, the rest of the people, they began the work. So the temple was started. And when the builders laid the foundation, there, oh, there it is, got the foundation. They knocked off all the debris. They relayed the foundation. Man, they're gung-ho. We're doing a work for God. We're building for God. And they're, they're all excited. God's at work in our midst again. We're back in Zion. We're on the same foundation, Mount Moriah, the very place where Abraham had offered up Isaac. This is the place. And the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. The priest sang a song. I should have put it in there. It was a praise song. It wasn't a hymn. The Lord the, it talks about the Lord's love and that he's good forever. And they must have sang it over and over and over and over again. Kind of like praise songs over and over and over and over again. And here they are. They're, watch what it says. And all the people gave a great shout of praise. They had a praise service. They had laid the foundation of the Lord. It says here, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. They're excited. God is back at work in the midst of his people. But, now as soon as you read but, you know you can disregard everything that went before, right? Here they are, man, they're, they're, they're doing everything. And, you know, a person gives you a wonderful compliment, and then they say, but. And you say, oh, you should have stopped right there. God says here, wait, but. Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads, I know later from the text, I just know, that they were 66 years old and older, thereabouts, 60s up, who had seen the former temple. Wait, they've been in the land over 50-some years, so that by the age of 10, they're about 66 years old or older. They had seen the former temple. They wept. You know why they're weeping? It's not the way we used to do it. It's not as big and grand and glorious as the one that was here before. Why are you skimping on the, the supplies and all that's going on here? Uh, hey, it was a lot larger than this. They began to weep because they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. That's not the way it was. My fear for a centennial year is we'll get so hung up on our past we won't realize we're in the present and looking to the future. To the future. Those who are older were so hung up on the past, they were so disappointed in what the younger generation was doing that they were weeping and crying while many others shouted for joy. Watch this. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping. Now, in the ancient world, they had professional mourners. When someone died, you'd hire people to come and mourn. 
and they'd wail until, you know, dust on their heads, and they wear sackcloth, and so they're really good at this. Listen, because the people made such a noise, the sound was heard for far away, and it was a mixed-up noise. You know what I want to tell you what's going on here? The older people were discouraging the younger workers. Whoa. This is nothing new. It's really nothing old. We, as parents, can discourage our kids so, so badly, verbally, that it damages and harms them emotionally and for their behavior for the rest of their lives. Spiritually, the same thing is true. My criticisms, my complaints, it's not the way we used to do it. I still like the old songs, whatever happened to the choir. You know, we used to have a bus ministry, or we did this, and our youth group was that, and we had a gym, and it goes on and on and on and on and on, doesn't it? They discouraged the workers so much that in the year 536, they quit building. It's now 520. For 16 years, they didn't lift a finger on the house of God. I say woe to those who are old and say it's not the way we used to do it. I know. And you still don't have a smartphone either. It's time. It's time. Now, 520, 16 years later, and the prophet asks. Here's where he comes with his question. Another one of your blanks to fill in on your bulletin. Long intro here. Listen. Who saw the former temple in all its glory? Only those over 66 years old. And then he says, and how does it look now? How does it look now? Third thing. What does it seem like to you? What does it seem like? And the answer, he gives it there in 2-3. Does it not seem to you like nothing? They had a bad attitude toward what God was doing in that people. And the word for nothing is like, it was in their eyes a big zero. Nothing. Bad attitude bad attitude. So how does God respond to the complaining and the critics, uh, those who, who are stuck in the past? How does he respond to the elderly here? How does he respond? He doesn't. <laughs> I love this. He doesn't. Instead, this is what he does. He says, be strong, be strong, be strong. Three times. Be strong. Notice what he says. Zerubbabel, be strong. Joshua, be strong. Hey, all the people of the land, be strong. And listen to what he says. And work. Just do what God has assigned you to do. That's it. Remember the story of Gideon? We were in, in that about a year ago. We were, we were you know, in the, uh, the book of uh, Judges. And that was just last, last year. We were in Judges. And, and God said to Gideon, you've got too many. He had to pare down his army till he got to the core. And God says, yeah, these, these are the ones. Because it's not really about bigness. It's about having my heart right with God and doing what God wants me to do when God wants me to do it, how God wants me to do it. It's all about him doing what he wants us to do, to work, to work. He says, for I am with you. That's what we want. We want God in this place. I, I want to come here when I worship. I want to experience the presence of God and the praise of his people and worship and adoration of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want that in this place. He has said here three times, declares the Lord, declares the Lord, declares the Lord, and the last one is declares the Lord Almighty. God is almighty. If he wanted something huge, he could do huge, and he doesn't even need the likes of us. He'll do it. 
He is almighty. He really doesn't need my tithe or offering. I need to give it so he'll bless me. He doesn't need it. Everything is his already. It's his. I think it's time for change around here as well. We've begun some wonderful changes here at, at, at Bethany. But we need a dream. We need a dream, a, a dream for worship that attracts the young and the old. Uh, we need a dream for church growth where we are following, doing what Jesus told us to do. He's going to build a church and we're going to be living stones. We're adding more people to it. That we fulfill the Great Commission and, and we have new outreaches and we reach out and we touch more people's lives and the body of Christ grows. To do that, we'll have to change. We'll have to change. Come on, folks. Vacation Bible school was huge when I was a kid. Our small church of like two or 300 people, we'd have that many kids in vacation Bible school. Guess what? Churches aren't attracting them through vacation Bible school today. What are they doing? Upward basketball, soccer clinics, and they're doing... We've got to adjust. We've got to make changes in how we do outreach to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to new people, new ways, with the same message that Jesus saves, that Jesus saves. God adds some encouragement. He says, this is what I covenanted with you when I came out of Egypt, and my spirit remained, uh, remains among you. Do not fear. When I came out of Egypt, they went down to Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, God came down upon the mountain, and the people were terrified by his holy presence and said, Moses, you go up and talk with them because we're afraid of God. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will, will be with you to keep you from sinning. Of course, he wants you to know he is an awesome God. Don't be afraid of him, though. He says, consider your attitude towards change. And he says, a question here, so, so why? Why would I do that? Why would I do that? And why? It's because God is a God of change. God is the God of change. When you got saved, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You changed. You changed from the inside out. That just happened. He's a God of change. And he said, and you've not seen anything yet. God is a God of change. More coming. More change is coming. In fact, listen to what the text says. In a little while, well, a little while, it's been a while, but it's a little while because God doesn't keep time like we keep time. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. He's not on our schedule because time is something he created and he's above and beyond and outside of time. In a little while, I will once more, once more shake the heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. A time is coming when all the nations are going to be really, truly shaken. And he says here, and the desired of all nations will come. Last Christmas season, we were singing a song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And then there's a line in it, Come, desire of all nations, come. It's based right on this passage. And so many have taken it that the, the coming of the desired of all nations is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a baby, and they've incorporated into that, that Christmas carol. Other theologians say, no, it's a reference to the second coming of Christ. In a little while, he's going to shake this whole planet. In Revelation chapter 6, in the sixth seal, when he breaks it, it tells us everything is shaken. The skies are shaken. The earth is shaking. And, and people are trying to survive through all this grand, terrible earthquake in a tribulation period yet to come. And the desired one of all nations, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to return to the earth and set up a kingdom that lasts for a thousand years. And I will fill this house with glory. I will fill this house with glory. I'm not sure which one it's referring to. It might be a reference to both. Because he is the desired one, and he has come. He goes on, he adds, listen, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. I could fund this project, it's no problem, but I want you to do the work. You have to do the work. The best change is yet to come. Here it is, verse 9. For the glory of this present house. What? There's only a foundation there. The old people are crying because it's so insufficient. 
and inadequate to all the glory of the previous temple that Solomon had. He said, listen, the glory of this present house will be greater than Solomon's glory. That, that former temple, says the Lord Almighty. I want to suggest for two reasons. Number one, Jesus is going to be in it. That temple that they built at that time, in the time of Haggai the prophet, under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua, that temple that they built would later be expanded on by Herod and the Herodian temple, and Jesus Christ himself was going to be dedicated in that temple. And we talked about that just a few weeks ago. He, he went and he was as a baby dedicated in that temple. He went every time for Passover in that temple. He preached in that temple, and Jesus himself was in that temple. And he, it says about him, he was the glory of the Lord, John 1, 14. The glory of the Lord filled that house with a greater glory than Solomon ever had because Jesus was in it. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. That's why I think there might be both Advents in view. First Advent, second Advent, because in the second Advent, Jesus sits upon his throne in the temple as a king upon his throne, he's also a priest upon his throne, and from that place he dispenses peace. Peace is coming to earth, not through the United Nations, not through President Trump, not through Netanyahu. Peace is going to come when Jesus returns and he establishes peace for a thousand years as just the introduction to the eternal state forever and ever and ever peace. He said, listen, you look at your past and you think, wow, so glorious. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Our glory days are ahead of us too. I, I'm convinced of that. That's why I believe God called me here. God's glorious glory days for this church are still ahead of us, not behind us. I believe in the concept of a Jesus-built church. We're built on the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and we're built upon the great commission to go into all the world, preach the gospel. When we do that work, when we do that work, Jesus builds the church. And he uses the likes of us to do it. For that reason, I believe the glory days of Bethany are yet ahead. So what's the point of all this? What's the point? God is a God of change. God is a God of change. We have an Old Testament, a New Testament. God is a God of change. I had an old life and a new life. I'm a new creature in Christ. God has got to change. What we need to do is consider our attitude toward change when a change is taking place. If God is actually in the change, don't fight it. Do not fight it. Embrace it because God is in it. That's the thought. That's the point. I want to leave with you. And you will know when God is in it. Because it will be righteous, it will be holy, it will be good. You will know. You will know. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are the great change agent. You gave us the gift of repentance to turn from our old life to a new life. You regenerated our hearts and gave us the spirit who prompts us in what is right. Lord, I pray that as your spirit bears witness with our spirits, that we will choose to do the good and shun the evil, that we will seek your will, not our will, to be done. Enable us to do that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.